Welcome back. Today on Exponential Africa, we are sitting with Ramez Nam, who is the co-chair at Singularity University for Energy, and he is also a best-selling author, having written the Nexus series, as well as the Infinite Resource. Welcome to the show. How's it, Mick? Good to be here. Yeah, great to have you. Um, just tell us a little bit about, you know, what does it mean to be a Singularity University co-chair around energy, and, 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 and what have you experienced over the last couple of years? It's just amazing. I mean, I've been with Singularity University since about 2011, and at the time I was writing about how the cost of solar and batteries and wind was declining exponentially, and by about 2015 it would be cheaper than coal or gas, and I think people had a hard time believing it, uh, and then it happened, more or less. And so now I get to talk about how much cheaper uh, in different parts of the world, like in South Africa. And why is South Africa going to be much cheaper? Well, South Africa is one of the sunniest places in the world. And if you look at the very uh, sunniest places, like uh, Chile, for instance, new coal power costs uh, six U.S. cents a unit, six U.S. cents a kilowatt hour. In Chile, it's two cents for solar, for new solar. It's two cents for new solar in uh, Mexico. It's two and a half cents in big parts of the Middle East. So in South Africa, it should be similar. And in fact, uh, your own uh, utility uh, planning document, plan resource planning document, found that, that the cheapest option for South Africa was to build as much solar and as much wind as possible. So we are, you know, we're going through this, this tough time in terms of energy in South Africa. And, you know, as you say, we could actually change it. If we just embrace solar or, or wind farms in a much greater way. You absolutely could change it. You could change it with solar and wind farms at the big scale. You could also change it with solar in a distributed fashion on homes, on office buildings, uh, with batteries at the, edge of the ed at the edge of the grid to take some of the load off. Uh, for the distribution lines. What, what is happening in the world of energy at the moment? What are some of the latest and greatest developments? Well, we're hitting a phase of disruption. I, I think about clean energy and having three phases. The first phase was it was only possible with big subsidies. The second phase, we really started just in 2015, just you know four years ago, was without subsidies in some places it was cheaper to build new solar or wind than it was to build new coal and that zone has spread rapidly to all the really sunniest parts of the world most of africa latin america the middle east india are now in that zone but then just uh, about three months ago in, in october of this year something crazy happened which is in the U.S. state of Indiana, which is not the sunniest place on Earth. It's like uh, okay sun and has good wind, but not a, not a ton of wind. There's a utility there called NIPSCO. It's 65% powered by coal, not unlike uh, South Africa. And that utility said in its five-year planning document that the cheapest thing it could do is get rid of almost all of that coal power and replace it with solar, wind, and batteries. Amazing. That's totally amazing. So that's a third phase, where solar and wind and batteries are cheaper, not just than building new coal or gas, but are cheaper than keeping existing uh, fossil fuel power plants running. And that, I believe, even though solar and wind are only about 8% of the world's electricity, that, I believe, is going to lead us to a rapid tipping point where country after country, utility after utility realizes they should scrap their old fossil resources because it's cheaper to build new clean energy than to operate what they've got. Amazing. Wow, that sounds very exciting. Very. And, and in terms of what else is going on in the, in the energy world, in the, in the transport world even? Yeah, so oil is a big part of how we use energy, and I think uh, two big things happened uh, in the last uh, just year, really. One is that we might have hit peak combustion automobile sales. So we've been saying for some time, electric vehicles now, we sold about 2 million electric vehicles around the world this year, as opposed to 1.3 million the year before. It's growing at, let's say, 70% per year. So in 2019, it might be uh, you know, 3.5 million sold. We thought that growth rate was such that by about 2023, it would be taking all the growth in automotive. And that happened early. In the wow. US, Europe, and China, uh, 2018 sales of passenger cars that were uh, gas or diesel dropped. And it looks like they'll drop again in 2019. And electric is taking all the growth. It's possible 
internal combustion engine cars will rebound a bit, and the real peak will be 2021, 2022, but it might not be. The Financial Times ran an article saying they think 2018 is the peak of combustion engine car wow. sales worldwide. What's it going to do to the oil industry? Well, it's the start of the end uh, for oil, or at least the plateau. Uh, you know, cars are only about a quarter of oil use. You add in cars and trucks, and you have uh, maybe 40 percent. You add in lubricants. Electric cars use almost no lubes, and you're up to about half of all oil consumption. And I think that has a chance to be uh, rapidly disrupted over the, the span of a, a decade uh, or two. And so peak oil demand, peak oil consumption, will probably happen in this decade. It might be five years from now, it might be as late as 10 years, uh, but it's, it's on the horizon. Amaz, it's been an honor uh, and a privilege uh, doing the show with you. Thanks so much. My pleasure, Mac. Always a pleasure. We're so excited to be having Ramez at our Singularity South Africa Summit in October. Thanks so much.